Okay. Um, today is Wednesday, June 10th, 2020. This is the regular meeting of the Rhinebeck Central School District Board of Education. Um, can I have a approval of a motion to approve the minutes of the May 26, 2020 regular meeting? Second. All those in favor? Okay, that motion passes. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of the June 2nd, 2020 special meeting? So moved. Second. All those in favor. Okay, we have an opportunity for public comment. If anyone wish to make a public comment, raise your hand so I can see if you're looking to make a public comment. Okay. Don't see any, okay? So seeing none, we're gonna move to reports and discussion. And the first item is recognition of our 2019-20 staff retirees. Okay. So as we all know what a difference, we all know what a difference educators can make in a student's life. Tonight, we're honoring 10 staff members who are retiring. Combined, they have worked in education for over 300 years. <laughs> I can only imagine the difference that they've made in the lives of so many students. Each year, the board takes time to recognize a staff member who will be retiring. And while this year is no exception, I'm truly sorry that we're not able to celebrate in person, to share a piece of cake, and to spend a few minutes hearing about your future plans. We're so glad that you're here with us, even virtually, so that we can honor each of you and celebrate what you've meant to the staff and students of the Rhinebeck School District. So first, um, Claire Dwyer has spent 41 years as an educator. She began her career as a general ed teacher, teaching in grades three, five, and seven. Claire has paid a, played a very special role in the lives of both her fellow teachers, her students, and countless families in Rhinebeck. As a master teacher, Claire has been a valued mentor for her colleagues, modeling the use of best practice. Her attention to detail, work ethic, and commitment assured she was an expert case manager. At Rhinebeck, she has been a dedicated advocate for learners with special needs. Understanding child development emotionally and intellectually, Claire has committed to making sure the students of her, the needs of her students were met. Those under her wing knew they would be protected and families could count on her to be a beloved guardian. After being trained in the empowerment model, she coached many from the age of 11 well into adulthood, thereby recognizing potential, instilling hope and changing lives. Her influence will last an eternity. The next is Amy Christie. Amy has been teaching for 34 years and the last 18 at Rhinebeck. Amy Christie has served the children of the district as a teacher of living environment, AP biology and forensics. She has served as the science department chair, the advisor of the environmental club, and is a dedicated 13 year veteran of the high school building level planning team. As a member of the building level planning team, Ms. Christie played a leading role in develop developing a number of initiatives to support student achievement including instituting the day of science ending with the practice of automatic ranking by GPA mix up the day in your high school lunch periods, administering school climate surveys and exit surveys, developing of student recognition programs, just to name a few. As a science teacher, Ms. Christie skillfully develops a love of science in her students through the combining rigor and highly engaging materials presented in a positive and supportive environment. Forensics course is one of the most popular electives in the school. I can tell you it was Shay's favorite course this year, so, so thank you very much. As students learn to become a scientist and to approach the world rationally and uh, scientifically, Ms. Christie's passion for developing scientists, scientists is matched by her commitment to the environment and developing environmentalists. As the advisor of the Environmental Club, her students have proposed and implemented many projects to benefit our environment, culminating in this year's in the year of their attendance at the Youth Environmental Sustainability Summit at the Ashcon Center. Okay, uh, next we have um, Bobby Bloomer. She's a BMS special education teacher and the Veterans Day program coordinator. Bobby's not only taught for 41 years, but is a Rhinebeck alumnus. She taught both sixth and seventh grade resource rooms and AIS classes as well, but the majority of her time has been working with the seventh grade. She is the school's local historian and knows the history of our residents in town. When greeting our new students, Ms. Blomer always says, I know your parents and your grandparents. She has shown countless kids how important it is to honor our veterans. This is a very special event. It's the highlight of the middle school. Every year it seems to get bigger and bigger because of the endless hours she has spent perfecting the program. One of her special talents was always managing to find the right moment to take a photo of our veterans who were so appreciative to have that photo. Uh -huh. Not only, not no one but you could have gotten a helicopter to land on our field, making sure to arrange for airspace and warning residents that a war wasn't going to break out. 
I can personally remember my kids showing their grandfather his name on a plaque in the cafeteria and seeing how touched he was by it. Whether, whether it was storing a goat in your classroom in the old Buck Buckley building for an ELA project, costuming a seventh grader for Expo, or snapping photos at the annual Halloween dance, students knew Ms. Bloomer was all about the kids. Your accomplishment at Rhinebeck are endless and unforgettable. Ms. Bloomer, thank you for giving your heart and soul to Rhinebeck. Next is Karen Sidor. She has been a teacher for 34 years. Karen started in an elementary teacher in the second grade before moving to the high school. Karen has served the children of our district as an academic support and reading teacher in the Department of English, as an advisor of the book club and of the diversity club, as a member of the building safety team, and as an important member of the child study team. On all of these roles, Karen's focus on supporting the individual student, whether it's through selecting high interest reading materials, providing a safe and supportive space for students, or through working collaboratively with the child study team to research and plan supports for students to enable them to meet their potential. As the academic support teacher, Ms. Ignor always says yes. Yes to fitting another student into her schedule. Yes to researching and employing other approaches to student support students. Yes to going to the extra mile. She consistently tailors her approach to meet the individual needs of students as she brings her wealth of knowledge to provide activities and resources to meet students where they are and to show them that they can succeed academically. Thanks to her work, her students become readers, writers, and thinkers. Okay, next we have uh, Laura DeWitt. She's uh, taught for 31 years in grades K, 1, 2, 4, and 5. To the delight of her students, she incorporated music into the classroom and, one is, and was one of the last teachers to have a piano in the elementary classroom. Um, my son was in your classroom many, many years ago, and I can still remember how much he enjoyed that. Uh, Laura was a crucial member of the grade, grade one team. She, was always, she has always been an advocate for the youngest students in the building. She is someone whom the CF, CLS faculty frequently went to for expertise and discretion, discreet personal advice, professional advice, sorry about that. A true asset to the educational environment that makes CLS such a wonderful place to be. This is Bill Carney. Bill has been a teacher for 33 years, starting as a computer science teacher. Bill has served the children of our district as a math teacher, as a coach, as the chair of the math department. As the algebra teacher in the high school, Mr. Carney continues to perform a crucial role in supporting our students as they master new learning standards in mathematics, making all of our students mathematicians who've learned how to use math to model our world. Mr. Carney is never out of, the is never out of his classroom and now more recently rarely out of the electronic content with his students and he works tirelessly to provide individualized support and instruction to his students, providing the foundation to excel in later math courses. As the math department chair, Mr. Carney led and supported his colleagues as they researched and implemented initiatives, practices such as standard-based grading, the flipped classroom, and the growth mindset in mathematics. His colleagues will miss the sound of the math alert coming from his room, as well as the Charles Dickens references. Many may remember his memorable approaches in the school musical, Damn Yankees. Uh, Barbara Rockefeller. She has worked as a cleaner for the district full-time since 1997. Barb is an amazing and dedicated staff member. Her extraordinary work ethic assured everything was done right. Those on the 211 wing have been spoiled with sparkling clean spaces. Barb is meticulous, dedicated, super kind, and caring. While tending to her work, Barb took the time to know all of the teachers, share stories of the family she adores, and all who enjoyed and all enjoyed talking with her. She always went above and beyond for teachers and families. Her approachable, friendly manner made it comfortable for kids and parents to seek her assistance after hours. She supported our students and looked forward to attending the school musical each year. Barb has provided the young and the old with a role model to follow. And I have one more story that shows exactly the kind of person that she is. After school lets out every day, Barb starts sweeping the hallways. You know she's there because there's neat little piles of dirt and dust swept off to the side. A few years ago, Barb caught me picking through those dust piles for pencils. Ever since then, I found a rubber band stack of pencils on my desk every few weeks. The kids call them floor pencils and they get reused on the daily. I'm sure that some of those pencils go through the cycle many times before eventually being worn down to an unusable nub. Barb is one of the hardest working people I know. She loves her family with all her heart and I will miss our chats after school. She made me feel welcome in a new job at a very uncertain time in my life and for that I will always be grateful. We wish her the best as she moves into a new chapter of her life. Jody Dooley has been an elementary teacher for 31 years teaching in kindergarten, first, second, and third grades. 
She has worked in many interesting places, including Oregon, Hanau, and Germany. Jody spent her career at CLS teaching in the primary grades, and she's always been someone who cares deeply about the energy developing skill of students K through two. She has been a faculty member that has always brought true skills and genuine thoughtfulness to her daily practice in the classroom and beyond. And uh, Joe's now gonna speak about Marvin Krebs. Uh, thank you, uh, Diane. Um, Marvin um, is a 40 year educator. Um, he, he started his career in 1980. Um, uh, working at a place that doesn't exist anymore, uh, which is the Rhinebeck Country School in Rhinebeck. Some of you may remember that if you're a long, long-term uh, Rhinebeck residents. And um, from there, over the course of the next 20 years, Marvin worked at the Anderson School, uh, at the Astor Learning Center, and at uh, Duchess, uh, Duchess Bosey's. Beta, they decided that just both sees. And in um, the year 2000, the Rhinebeck Central School District was fortunate enough to be able to offer Marvin a position with us as uh, an academic uh, intervention services teacher. Uh, having, having come from a long background of working with uh, students with special needs, he was perfectly suited to work with, uh, with our students who, who were in need of academic intervention services. Um, uh, over the next couple of years, Marvin transitioned at Rhinebeck from his position as an AIS teacher to his current position um, as a director of, uh, of curriculum and instruction. Um, Marvin is, is one, of, one of the brightest individuals that, uh, that I've known in my career. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, he's reflective. Um, he's dedicated. Uh, he has worked in, his, in Rhinebeck for 20 years and uh, gradually transitioned to his current position as Director of Curriculum and Instruction over a few years. Um, and then an interesting thing happened. Uh, that's what happens when you, when you do a good job in your, in your chosen work, uh, you start getting or taking on more roles. Uh, and um, Marvin uh, morphed, his job morphed into um, being uh, responsible for uh, the district's data reporting function, which itself has grown steadily over the last 10 or more years. Um, and uh, most of you, if not all of you, uh, know what happens when you take on more work. Uh, you, you rarely lose any work because it's, it's always more and not this for that. And uh, Marvin does quite an amazing job uh, in a very challenging and uh, diverse uh, position that he holds currently. Um, and not, not to say that all of you who are uh, leaving our district for the purposes of retirement will, will be tough acts to follow. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, but uh, it's my opinion that Marvin will also be an extremely difficult person to find another person with the varied skill sets that he has uh, to be able to take over for him when he retires, fortunately, uh, and hopefully he's, will be, he will be with us until uh, mid to late uh, September, um, but uh, he will be missed uh, as, as will all of you. Um, so uh, Marvin, thank you for all you've done for the district as well as for all the other retirees who've been recognized here. Uh, you've all made amazing contributions in your own special and unique ways, and it's been my pleasure to have known you and work with you uh, over the last number of years. Thank you, Diane. Yes, and with that, we have our last retiree, Tom. If you'd like to get his own. Tom, you're special. retiring. <laughs> 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 kind of wish maybe I was at this moment, but still got a few years to go. So, 
Um, Joe, I know you had your own special night, but, um, you know, on June 30th, when you leave us, that will be your completion of your 46th year in education. Uh, Joe began his career as an English teacher, and believe me, I need his word smithing. I'm going to miss <laughs> it dearly. Uh, in Wheatsport uh, in New York, it's out near Syracuse, where he be later became the assistant principal. Uh, Joe moved on, became the high school principal at Fabius Pompey. Pompey. No, Pompey. You, you got it right Pompey. the first time, Pompey. Tom. Okay. Yep. And uh, he later became the interim superintendent of schools there. Um, he would later become the superintendent of schools at Inlet Common School District and Town of Webb uh, Central School District before coming to us in August of 1998. So I want to take a little step back. So about 20 years ago, uh, before I was lucky enough to work here, I spoke to my predecessor, Shirley Kennelly. Um, I spoke to her about working relationships with superintendents and business officials. I came from a very, I, I, I just had left a rocky relationship with the superintendent. And I spoke to her at length about this relationship. And we talked about what that relationship would look like, where the superintendent is the educational leader. And, 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 uh, and whereas the business official, well, let's step back. Joe is the educational, developing ideas, taking ideas from people, trying to come up with you know, ways to improve student learning. Well, my job is to, what's that financial implication? What are those implications of that? I'm not the decision maker. I help provide that information for everybody to make decision, whether it be the superintendent of the board. But we talked about that balancing act between, with Shirley, between students, parents, taxpayers, unions, board of ed, and, and Shirley told me that's exactly what he, she had in Joe. So she couldn't stop talking about how lucky she was to work for her as a boss. And I told her, I hope that someday I would be able to be able to work with somebody like that. Lo and behold, five years later, Shirley retired and I applied for the job. And luckily, I did come through and I happened to be, uh, be chosen to be the business official. And I'd never have regretted that for one moment. I, I got a mentor for the past 14 years, though it's not in the field of business, okay? He isn't mentoring me on how to do school finances. But that whole side of administration, working with principals, working with the board, I learned so much from him. And what I learned from him was a couple things. Treat all people equally. Doesn't matter if they're workers, parents, students, taxpayers, board members, you treat them all as equals and listen to them. And that was one good, not one good thing. He's got many great things. But one thing he did, he listened to the ideas, he listened to the complaints, and he took it all in. And he weighed all those things before he made decisions. So it's just been a, a a wonderful relationship with Joe. He's always ready to work, comes into the office bright and early, not leaving until his tasks are completed at the end of the day. We rarely see him take any time off for himself. And at times, it seems we need to encourage him to take some vacation. And uh, Joe, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, they're not real vacations. You <laughs> went down there and worked. Uh, so, <laughs> but um, Joe's been the superintendent of schools here in Rhinebeck for 22 years, not only dedicated to this school district, but also to the greater Rhinebeck community, uh, but more importantly to his family. This is now his time to spend more time with Pat and his grandchildren and the rest of his family. We in the business office all wish him all the health, peace, and relaxation in his retirement and hope he comes by to drop off his insurance check, not put it in the mail, so we can always catch up so we can hear how his life in retirement is treating him. Good luck, Joe. I'm gonna miss Thank you. you. Thank you. Looking forward to working with you, Albert, but I am gonna miss Joe. <laughs> well, congratulations to all our retirees. Like, normally at this time, we, we take a few minutes to share some cake, but um, if it would be okay with the rest of the board members, if anyone wants to say anything, a few words, anything, I guess we could, we could allow for that at this time, given that we have no cake or not in the same room. Anybody wants to say anything? You don't feel any pressure too, but I just want to give anybody the opportunity if they wanted to say anything. But it's so good to see you all, see your faces. Some of you haven't seen in a while. Uh, 
anyone tell me if anybody's hands up if anybody wanted to make a comment? I'll, can't, I'm looking. Anyone see anybody? Joe, you see any hands? I don't. See I anybody. don't. I just just scanned the crowd. I'm not seeing anybody. Okay. Well, again, I thank you again for everything that you've done, and you enjoy, enjoy your retirement. Thank you again. Okay, um, that brings us to uh, principal's reports. Uh, Brett, there you are. Okay. Evening, everyone. Uh, there's a few things happening. I focus more on the end of year activities and some of the things that are uh, that are happening around uh, Chancellor. Uh, our our book ended events, of course, kindergarten graduation uh, will be this Friday at 10 a.m. and we're going to actually do it in the uh, the drive through. The team has been working on a we'll set up cones and everything. And we're going to have a drive through uh, graduation for them. Uh, Organizing, organizing it by teacher. Um, so we're excited to do that on Friday for those students at 10 a.m. at Chancellor. Um, our grade five moving up ceremony is at the fairgrounds on Monday at 10 a.m. And um, I have to say is one of the you know, biggest end of the year activities and, and there's always a lot of planning going on uh, going into that event, but this year was a little bit different for obvious reasons. Um, and I just have to commend the fifth grade team uh, Jill Simmons is grade level chair has done a phenomenal job organizing all those plates up in the air at once and uh, just really work through the home stretch here. So it's just done an amazing job in putting that whole event together. So looking forward to that on Monday at 10 o'clock at the fairgrounds. Um, also, uh, Jill was all, Jill and the fifth grade team also put together a video. Um, again, I have to thank her for piecing it all together. Um, we're quite excited about it. Um, it it's, it's kind of a graduation uh, send off uh, about um, about nine minutes long, eight minutes long, and it's just a really nice. All the um, almost all the kids are are represented vi vi uh, visibly, and then the shout out for the students who weren't able to participate on that piece at the end. But it's just a beautiful video. We're going to send it out for fifth grade parents uh, tomorrow, um, and I want to thank them again, Jill specifically, for piecing it all together. She's really been moving forward on this uh, for the last couple weeks. Um, other grades are doing uh, very personal uh, things. First grade uh, teachers are having a drive through as well. Um, I know Mrs. Lynch, I had heard uh, that she's uh, gonna uh, obviously distance, but um, visit each one of her students and she's putting together a little carpool for, for that, uh, 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 caravan for that. So there's a lot of different things happening, celebrations. I didn't cover it all. A lot of teachers, by the way, um, have done some of those drive-bys for their classes in the last 10 weeks, actually, as part of just keeping connected. Um, wanted to mention curriculum proposals be coming your way pretty soon. Um, before the uh, closings, we had focused, we were going to primarily focus on writing, the writing units and uh, live labs, uh, science, next-gen science curriculum, K-5. to um, And so we were able to start securing those Obviously those proposals, people put them in, but I mentioned it because we added, there's, there was kind of a third piece and there's quite a few groups looking at online platforms and things, exploring them like Canvas, things like that. So uh, that was a bit of an addition to what we initially had expected earlier in the school year for proposals. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to really in this forum and looking for any forum I can to, uh, to really thank my staff at Chancellor. It has been amazing watching them work through this and, and helping in every way I can. Um, I've really been uh, able to, to just be as involved as they'll, they've allowed me. I've had wonderful invitations from so many of them. Um, and I have to say just the level of professionalism and the level of creativity that has come out of all the work that they've been doing across the grades is just phenomenal. And it's just been amazing to watch. And I just, I just wanted to thank them. I know we're, we're wrapping up in the next two days of the end of school, but uh, the grace in which my staff has moved forward and included their their teacher, uh, their their fellow teacher certainly, but not only that, the community, students, their parents, uh, their family, families. It's just been amazing to watch, and I just wanted to thank them. Um, and looking forward to getting our survey survey results and working through the summer to figure out what's happening for September. But that's how we're wrapping up the year, at Chancellor. Anybody have any questions for Brett? I don't have a question. I just, I hope someone is videotaping all these things. Just, I'm just imagining these kindergartners with their drive. I, <laughs> I, hope, I hope there's a video from all of these celebrations that, that come out. We'll have, we'll probably be able to piece something together, but uh, we'll definitely throw that out as an idea. I'll see where we're at with it, especially those two events. It should be fun to watch. Well, thank you. It sounds like there's a lot of special things happening.
for the year. I'm sure the families appreciate that. Okay, uh, John, right, there you go. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to start by saying that uh, I, uh, I, I've had the pleasure of working very closely with five of the, uh, the 10 retirees, uh, Barb and Claire and Bobby and, and certainly Joe and Marvin as well. And, uh, you know, I, I've been in this business uh, not as long as they have, uh, but I've been in this business for 29 years now. Um, and I've never worked uh, with such a, such a dedicated group of, of professionals as each one of those individuals is. Um, I, I, I find this forum very difficult um, in terms of a celebration. Uh, I, I do not like hearing all of those wonderful things about uh, each one of the individuals that are retiring uh, this, this, this evening and this year. Um, and uh, it's, it's just far too quiet. So <laughs> a, little, a, little, a little singular round of applause. Um, uh, again, just uh, just too too quiet to celebrate too many wonderful individuals. Um, in the middle school, uh, similar to Brett, uh, you know, we just continue to uh, try and finish up our, our end of the year activities. Um, this has been a difficult time for everyone, students, parents, teachers, uh, you know, families, um, finding creative ways to keep students engaged, finding uh, interesting and creating ways creative ways uh, to, to communicate with parents and to communicate with students. Um, I'm gonna kind of lead uh, where, where Brett finished up, but uh, the middle school faculty and staff has been just amazing throughout this closure. Um, I'm fortunate in that uh, I, am, I am being copied into and, uh, and many, many things are being shared with me now, just in terms of the very positive feedback that we're receiving. And that really is a, a testament to the dedication of the middle, middle school staff. Um, as I said, we've, we've looked for a lot of creative ways to kind of mirror many of the activities that, uh, that we do in a normal year. Um, uh, Marla Ulrich, uh, the evening that was to be the, uh, the middle school uh, BMS uh, spring concert, sent an email to all the parents just talking about what a wonderful uh, you know, opportunity and, and activity that is and how much she looks forward to it each year. And, as I reflected on her email, uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, the end of the school year has been just as hectic, just as chaotic as, uh, as every other school year has been. Um, but unfortunately, this closure has robbed us of a lot of the, the, uh, the positive activities that really make all that work worthwhile. Um, so a couple of the things that we've really uh, been working on over the course of the last week uh, we want to make sure that we welcome in our fifth grade students and our fifth grade parents. Uh, each year we hold building level tours. Uh, Mrs. Rodier and Mrs. Fountain uh, conduct those. Uh, we also hold a fifth grade parent orientation night. Um, and uh, it, it's important that we, we share that information. Um, again, we recognize that uh, the transition is a large one for students, both students and parents. And we want to make sure that we provide that information for them. So with the help of uh, uh, Rhinebeck alum, uh, James Erlanger has been uh, assisting us with uh, creating videos, a video for parents, a video for students. It'll include uh, introductions from just about all of their, the, the sixth grade staff that will be working with their children uh, next year. Uh, it will include a, uh, a, a tour. Um, we, we videotaped and, and fortunately we conducted this, uh, we did this last week, we videotaped Mrs. Fountain um, uh, touring the building before the front of our school has been torn up and the sixth grade lockers have been torn out. And uh, we'll share a lot of that information with our students. Uh, Mr. Weisenthal has uh, conducted interviews with many of our sixth grade students, similar to what we do with the orientation night and the information that they share uh, as our outgoing uh, sixth graders, new seventh graders, uh, has, always, has always been valuable to parents. So that's been an activity uh, that's been an activity over the course of the last couple of weeks, and we look forward to sharing those with our fifth grade parents um, in the next week or so. In addition to that, we've been talking about how we honor our uh, eighth grade students in this, in this virtual world. Um, we settled upon the eighth grade staff, uh, and, and I settled upon uh, a caravan. Um, we're going to take the show on the road. We're going to, uh, all of us are going to go to them, and we're going to spend two afternoons next week 
uh, touring the district and, uh, and, and seeing all of our eighth grade students for one last time. Uh, we have a number of parents that have been working with us. We have a number of surprises with them. We've, uh, we've uh, created um, one of a kind t-shirts commemorating the class of 2020 that they'll receive next week. Uh, we've been working with Samuel's Sweet Shop uh, and they are creating a, a, a unique and exclusive uh, treat for our eighth graders that they'll receive as well, uh, along with all of their certificates. Uh, holy cow, Dells, lots of, lots of ice cream, uh, all sorts of things. So we're looking forward to doing that next week. Um, and then moving ahead and, and, and looking ahead, uh, you know, similar, similar to Brett, we have a lot of uh, fantastic summer curriculum projects that are gonna be coming your way. Uh, again, we look to, you know, in the middle school uh, in particular, we've got a number of people that are expanding their use of Canvas uh, and looking for that consistency across a single platform. Um, so you'll, you'll, you'll be getting those soon. And we look forward to that work. Again, as Brett said, uh, we look forward to getting the, summer, the, uh, the survey results and doing some planning this summer for a, a, an, an uncertain future uh, at this point. Um, and just to end on, on one uh, kind of final positive note and uh, give a shameless plug, uh, the second reminder for the Rhinebeck Strong gear uh, came out, went out to all community members uh, last evening. I wanted to let everyone know, you'll know, uh, you'll re recall that uh, this is a, an initiative um, that started with the BMS Student Council. And uh, $3 from every uh, apparel item is being donated, uh, split and donated to the two local food pantries that serve our community. Uh, as of this afternoon, uh, that donation to the Rhinebeck Food Pantries is up to $475. Um, so we're very pleased about that. Uh, excited to, uh, to see uh, a few weeks from now, everybody in their Rhinebeck Strong gear, uh, just reminding all of us that, uh, you know, that, that, that hawks fly, fly together. And, uh, and our community works together uh, during, during these unprecedented times. Uh, so with that, that's uh, a little bit of what's going on in this virtual world in BMS. Thanks, John. Any questions for John from the middle school? John, great things going on there. Thank you for everything you're doing. Again, just like with Brett, I'm sure your families will appreciate and the students will appreciate everything that's been done. Thank you. Ed, oh, there you are. Thanks, Hello. Diane. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, Friday, June 12th is the end of instruction, as I'm sure uh, our students and families know. And uh, certainly our families and students deserve an enormous amount of credit for uh, partnering with us as they always do to navigate uh, these unprecedented times. Um, as we conclude remote instruction, our students um, have produced and are continuing to produce some culminating projects. Uh, K-12 art teachers and students have produced a virtual art show. Uh, last week, our student council, uh, under the, uh, the guidance of uh, Mr. Moore, uh, conducted and ran, ran virtual student council elections. And we have a slate of officers in uh, grades 10, 11, 12 for this coming school year. Um, the high school music department uh, we'll be publishing uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. through YouTube uh, a spring showcase of uh, uh, their uh, students' uh, musical performances. Um, the Rhinebeck High School Literary Magazine will be publishing its uh, quarantine edition of uh, their literary magazine, Murmur, and that will come out on, on Friday. Uh, I'd like to remind you that all of our student activities are um, uh, reported on and publicized through our school newspaper, Rhinebeck Reality, avail available on rhinebeckreality.org. And there's also, as I've said many, time, many times, an app for that. Uh, so please uh, check out those uh, platforms and, and see the work of our, our student journalists. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we have, uh, as you know, two uh, important uh, ceremonies. Our academic and athletic awards ceremony this year will be combined into one ceremony. Uh, a virtual ceremony which will be published um, uh, in the evening of Friday, June 26th. And of course, we uh, continue to plan for our commencement on June 27th. And I wanna take a moment to sort of unpack that word we um, and recognize 
uh, the work of our senior class officers and our senior class advisor who have um, uh, diligently and tirelessly worked with Mr. Berg and with me and with our staff to think about a commencement and to try to plan for all the contingencies and all the unknowns. They certainly did not um, sign up uh, for this sort of work when they were elected as class officers, but they performed admirably. Um, in addition, I'd also like to, uh, to recognize our building level planning team, uh, whom Mr. Berg and I uh, tapped and asked them for, for their support and guidance and counsel as we planned uh, a, a, a commencement during a pandemic. We've Obviously, none of us have ever done that before, so we needed um, as much good thinking as we could get uh, uh, to, to, to reach that objective. So we're, we're looking forward, of course, to, um, uh, to those ceremonies. I know uh, many people, uh, the high school staff included, have, have thought about and, and reflected upon uh, some of the silver linings that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we, we encounter as we, again, navigate these difficult times. And I think uh, for me, certainly, and for my, my faculty, one of the silver linings is to, to be reminded of the wonderful uh, community support our students have uh, and our, our school has. And this has really been made concrete for all of us through all of the fantastic uh, donations, suggestions, offers to help uh, in, uh, put in place to recognize our, our senior class. So I, I do want to take a moment to recognize the, the wonderful work that our community is doing to uh, to celebrate our seniors. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, an update from the high school. Any questions for Dr. Dumport? Ed, same thing. Thank you and your staff for all the work you've been doing. And uh, we look forward to graduation. <laughs> all, right. Right. all right, next, um, we're going to move to the small school. Woo. Smart Schools Bond Act Investment Plan, Phase Two Report, Mr. Jensen. Sure, um, Whitney, if you want to share the screen, if you've given me permission. Let's see. Okay, is everybody seeing it? Yep. Okay. So um, just, I'm just going to take you through a very quick review. I'll try to be brief with my comments tonight. Um, the Smart Schools Investment Plan was part of a $2 billion uh, referendum that was back in, I'm thinking, 2015, Tom? I, I'm, I'm not sure, but at it's least, been... It's been at least that in five years. At least right. Five years. Um, so anyways, um, that, that money was distributed among school districts, and we had uh, an allocation of about $277,000. And so um, it had six categories in which um, we could apply this money to, and they're listed right there. And we began to work on category one. Um, we looked at high-speed broadband. We were looking at building our infrastructure, uh, which was ha had some weak spots in it. Um, we also looked at uh, item number two, which was learning technology equipment. And we also looked at item number six, which was high-tech security features in our school buildings. So um, those were the three that we focused on. And when we did phase one, and here's just a short review of it, is that we had allocated and proposed to the state that we were going to spend $139,000. Um, and this was primarily uh, some upgrades in our closets, um, some, um, some um, fiber, uh, particularly the dark fiber that would go between uh, Chancellor and the uh, high school or the main campus. And uh, that was a complicated project. And that, that took us several years to push that through. Uh, a lot of regulations, a lot of hurdles, a lot of barriers. Uh, um, but we actually uh, went out and did that job uh, twice. And uh, we came out, uh, actually, at, in the end, we came out very well. And you'll see that number in a minute. Um, so the original plan was that we would spend $139,000 on those upgrades. We would have $20,000 in high-tech security, which left us a balance of about $118,000 for classroom technology. Now, the next slide will show you what, where we ended up after phase one. 
school connectivity went from 139,000 down to $63,000. The cost of the dark fiber between the buildings ended up being much less after we rebid the job. And uh, we were able to uh, actually complete that job. That job uh, was completed as, as late as in May. And I'm happy to announce that we uh, were able to turn off the circuit that we've been renting for over $800 a month. We were able to turn off that circuit this month. So now the district will realize a savings of about $800 a month going forward. And we have well over 10 times the speed between the buildings. So a vast improvement. Um, and we're very happy. And, and the only thing that we haven't been able to do is, is we haven't had a, a, a full building yet to test it out and to, to, to push it. So uh, we're looking forward to being able to do that. So with $63,000 completed, um, we were able to do um, the other infrastructure that needed to be done. Um, we were able to do through general fund and through some other uh, funding sources, and we were able to upgrade um, the, um, the closets with uh, the various uh, uh, network equipment that we needed. So again, it came down to uh, only $63,000 for that project. We, and we still wanted to honor the high tech security um, uh, initiative that we have there. So we still left the $20,000 there, which now brings us up to a balance of $193,000. I'm going to go back to the previous slide, was $118,000. Now it's $193,000. So that's where we stand right now. Now, that means that, uh, again, this is just really a repeat of that, but um, basically phase two, we are only going to present the classroom technology piece. We are waiting for some decisions on the high tech security. That will be phase three with the balance of the $20,000. So we have basically $193,000 that we are looking to spend on classroom technology. One of the things that we realized, and this was even several years ago, was that we have a um, aging projector systems within each of the classrooms. Every classroom has a projector in it, usually to a smart board, um, sometimes to a whiteboard. And so we wanted to look at replacing, well, I believe there's approximately 100 classrooms across the district. So we're looking at replacing all of those classrooms that have projectors with a 70 inch interactive Dell screen. And we've spent uh, a couple of superintendents conference days introducing that particular device to the staff and um, offered that as, as one of the uh, modules that they could take on the superintendents conference day where we uh, concentrate on technology. We have a couple of um, challenges with that. Obviously, 100 um, TV mounts and mounting 100 TVs is, is a large project. So we have talked to BOCES about that. And they are prepared and, and have given us a, a, an estimate of uh, what it would cost to install those. The other challenge that we had is, is many of our classrooms, particularly in the high school uh, um, on the first floor, is that we have a lot of old slate boards, the blackboards, and those are not removed. And so these, you cannot drill into those. Um, behind that, it's, it's our understanding that there's asbestos glue that was behind those and we're not going to drill through the slate. Um, so we have to uh, basically buy some special mounts and about I think it's 40 classrooms, if my memory serves me correctly, that we have to do something where the TV would, the mount would actually go over the smart, uh, the over the blackboard, and then we can mount the TV to that. So, um, so that's where we're going to go with with the uh, classroom technology and just basically replacing the the projector systems, which are are beginning to fail quite regularly now. Um, Brendan has done a, a, a terrific job actually in in. Uh, trying to keep those things running and, and you know, if one goes down, he, he takes the parts out and puts them in another. I mean, we, he really tries to keep them running as, as best he can, but we're really up against the wall with those, those devices and, they, and the replacement is, is really paramount for, for our classrooms and for our teachers. So this is just a quick review of how this process works and what your responsibility is as a board. Um, we are at this box right here where the preliminary plan is presented to the board. That's, that's where we're at. And what I'm looking for is, and you can let Joe know by the end of the week, just um, you know, whether you have any concerns about this plan, any questions about it, um, anything that you might want uh, possibly reconsidered. Um, if he hears nothing from you, um, the district then posts that plan for, whoops, I jumped there. The district posts that plan for 30 days on the website. And then we announce a public uh, notice and a public hearing. 
and uh, we hold that after the 30 days and we have that public hearing. At that meeting, the board can vote to go ahead and approve this plan, or if there are concerns that have been brought up by the public, they could delay the approval of that plan, and then we go back to the drawing board, and we, we, uh, we're back up into you know, the preliminary plan again, and then we post for 30, uh, 30 days, and we go through that part of the cycle again. So then, if all goes well, and, and uh, the approval is done at this point at the public hearing, then I go back and I resharpen the pencil and I, I basically get the, the latest and updated quotes, prepare the final plan, have the final numbers and uh, really fine tune it at that point. And then the board is given a, a chance to uh, vote, vote on that final plan. And then I submit that plan to the state. And that really is in a nutshell, what has to happen with each and every phase that we do. We go through this entire process each and every time that we have a phase. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or not, but I think that's the next slide is, is questions and answers. So um, certainly open to, to any kind of uh, questions you might have. Steve? Just two quick questions. Uh, can you share a little bit of the, the feedback from the, the teachers that took um, that class at Superintendent's Day? And what's the time frame? I know with the Doc Fiber dealing with the state, it took two years to kind of get approval. What, what's the plan for now until then if these things keep failing? Well, we have some monies coming back on, on some E-rate on the dark fiber project. And I plan on using that money on that to fill the, the, um, the, the, the absolutely critical areas where we've actually had complete failures and we need to do something. Um, it won't buy us anywhere near 100, obviously, you know, but I could probably do 15 to 20 classrooms with that money. And uh, so, if I can do that, then I can at least hold that off and, and be able to uh, do at least that many classrooms, which will then in turn, um, you know, th this is always the problem with this is that um, I'm not going to use all the money, you know, and I might have to come back and, and when we do phase three, there might be some more classroom technology in there or something different, but phase three might look slightly different than just $20,000 for high tech. Um, but I do know that, uh, you know, with these mounts and, and the uh, various costs that are in, uh, involved here, you know, I wanna make sure that we have at least some money there as a buffer to, to make sure that we can cover those costs should we do that. So in the short term, yeah, there's some E-rate money that's coming to us from the dark fiber project. And uh, that, that's my plan is to use it as a, as a stock gap measure until the uh, approval is done by the state. Okay, then the teacher feedback on the Oh, the teacher the feedback on the thing has been positive. Um, we, we do um, reviews with, uh, you know, every time we do a, a, a class or a session on those uh, superintendents conference days, we have a uh, evaluation sheet that comes back and people are, have generally responded positively to it. Um, some of the question, you know, whether we, we look at other devices and, and we, you know, we, we've explored some of those. Usually um, what has steered us away has been cost. Um, the, these machines are, um, are much cheaper than some of the other options that are out there and, um, and are very well and highly recommended. We're not the only school district in Dutchess County using these. Uh, quite a number of school districts are adopting this, this as their technology in the classroom. Yes. Mark? Oh, Jacqueline, I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh, should I go? Okay. Um, so uh, on the... Um, the TV mounts going over the slate chalkboards, yep. um, will those be movable? I mean, will the slate chalkboards be completely out of commission? Are there- Well, right now what we have is this, the smart boards that are mounted there right now currently is a similar kind of mount. Um, it comes out above the chalkboard, goes in front of it, and then go, and it's mounted to the wall below the chalkboard. So it's this big C-shaped mount that you know basically jumps over the the the, uh, the blackboard, and so that's what we have currently, and that's what we would adopt for the uh, for these monitors. Now these monitors are touchscreen, so they have a a gorilla glass on them, so they're a heavier, uh, much heavier than the smart boards. So we have to make sure that they're rated properly, and that they, uh, I believe, I don't remember how, how many hundred pounds they're they're. I think it's, it's above two hundred. I believe is the rating on these smart boards are very light. They're not rated for that, so it's not like we can use the smart board mounts that are there to mount these TVs, they would just be insufficient. So we have to get new mounts that are much more durable and, and uh, robust. But it's basically just replacing one spot, for one yep. 
Yeah, they, they, the, the space that they lost, they've always ha didn't have because the smart board's there already. So there's no loss of space. Okay, and and do the have the teachers given feedback on? I mean, are they they had an opportunity to to weigh in on if their classroom is getting one of these? I mean, I, well, I'm the idea is to cover all of them. What we want to do is right. co yeah, do all 100 classrooms is the goal. So have have there has there been any pushback from teachers about have do they know this is happening and well, they, they've heard yeah they've heard of it uh the people on the committee have gone back they know uh the biggest question and it was brought up is when you know because the state is it's a very slow process to go through that thing um it did take a couple of years for the uh the dark fiber but that was a much more complicated project i'm hoping that within a year you know, i'm hoping within a it'll be a 12-month cycle for us before we do this I, Ideally, I would love to be doing it next summer, but I, I, you know, have no way of knowing because I don't, I'm not in control of that timeline. Okay. And, um, and lastly, uh, I'm sorry if you said this at the beginning, but the $277,000, um, where was that money coming from? The state had put out back in 2014, 2015, a general referendum bond issue on, on the ballot and the voters approved it at that point in time. And then it was distributed by population, social economics, you know, um, um, condition of the of the district, and all of those kinds of things. Um, for some districts, it was it was quite a lot of you know quite a bit of money. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, I think it was Newburgh had a twelve million dollar allocation. So you know, I mean, it, it varied from district to district as to what it, what we got, and so we ended up with two hundred seventy seven thousand dollars at that time. Did that come from state yes. gathered tax money or was it locally gathered? State. They it issued, it came they from the bond that was, bond. That was yeah, floating. The bond. I just wanted to clarify for yep. people listening. Thank you. Mark? Mike, you're, you're muted. muted. Steve, could you briefly um, just tell us what the differences are between the Dell uh, interactive screens and the smart board? Well, the, um, the screens are our 70 inch screen and some of our smart boards are a little bit larger than that. Some of them are a bit, bit smaller than that. Um, but what really makes this a, um, uh, a attractive product is the resolution that's on it. We've had it for several years in our library and a couple other places in the conference room. You probably have all seen it. Um, those uh, in the lobby, for instance, at CLS right now, there's, there's one, they're all of, of that nature. They're all that size. And, um, the, the, the ones that we'd be ordering would be slightly different because they are a touch screen. Most of them that you see right now are, are just TVs, but the touch screens, which we'd be putting in the classroom gives them the same or comparable, um, experience as a smart board, a touch screen, you know, that's interactive. The, the students can go up and touch the screen, move things around. Not everything, you know, you, you can't say that all the features are there or that there might be more features that weren't on the smart board platform. Um, but we, uh, we uh, were given assurances and we've tested it out where um, things like smart notebook, which is the software program, that's the primary concern that teachers have had. Can I bring my smart book, smart notebook uh, materials onto that interactive screen, and they are able to do that. Liz? Um, so in the expense of it, uh, who's going to be doing the labor, and is the labor included in the expense of yeah, would, the numbers you're giving? Yeah, we would have to include that labor in the expense. Um, I will tell you that we had um, an estimate from Dell out of that money, out of the 198,000 or whatever, the estimate from Dell, I think was close to $60,000 for installation, which was um, outrageous in, in my, in my estimation. Um, but BOCES is willing to do it for substantially cheaper. Um, I think it's in the $20,000 range um, to do a hundred, a hundred machine, you know, and mounting them and, and setting them up for us. And that's included in the cost. And um, so with the new laptops that we're getting for everybody, are they going to be able to talk to these, to the new Dell screens? Yes. Yes. Uh, particularly at the secondary level. Well, every classroom now, I believe, has a um, um, Apple TV device. 
So it would hook up to that anyways. Right now, they're, the Apple TV devices are hooked to the projectors. Now we would just simply move those to the, to the TVs. It's an HDMI connection, so it'll be, the transition is going to be smooth there as well. Any, uh, Jacqueline? Sorry, two more. Um, is, uh, is there a support or warranty included in these? Yes. What happens if they? Yes. Happens? Usually it's a, it's a one or two year warranty on them. Um, that's one of the things that I wanted to negotiate with them when we do the fine tuning is, is what would that be if we added an extra year to it? I, pref I generally tend to, for instance, with most of our equipment, I try to get a three year warranty out of them um if i can um tvs i you know that i expect them to be at least a, a 10 year have a lifespan of 10 plus years you know up in that range um so i'd like to cover them for at least three if i can um most of the time that usually they come with a standard one year but uh that's something that we have to negotiate going forward but we do try to do a three year if we can and then the other question um when we're talking about classroom technology can AV equipment, um, like for the auditorium, count as classroom technology? Yes, it can. Just sort of thinking about a line item on, um, was it the- uh, On the budget, yeah. Yeah, yeah. on the budget yeah. sound. Um, like yeah, that, that's gonna come down to when we fine tune the numbers and see whether we can do that, you know, and how many we'll replace with the um, E-rate money that's coming in from the dark fiber um, that should help us as well. So if we have the, the money, it's something that could be taken under consideration. Absolutely. It, it certainly would apply. Let's put it that way. Any other questions? Uh, see, I just have to say nothing to do with you, but even if it would take a year to get an answer back from this, that's completely unacceptable and outrageous. Nothing to do with you, but I concur. I, I, uh, well, I, can't help I have lived with that frustration for a number of years. So yes. Like um, it, I, I just don't wish. I wish we could not accept that, but it's just. Uh, it, it, we're not alone in that. There have been many groups that have gone to the state complaining about it, but that's the way that they have it right now. Will probably be new technology by that time before we get approved. That's, that. And that's always another issue because sometimes the prices drop, sometimes they go up. Most of the time they do drop, but um, and you have to make adjustments and you have to do that midstream and then wait for that to get approved. And it's it's not an easy task, but. It's uh, and you're not alone in your sentiments, believe me. Steve, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but this this uh, smart schools bond project has been riddled with ridiculous delays uh, from from the get go. Uh, the committee up at the up in Albany that meets they only meet like four times a year, so you can see how the whole project gets gets pushed out. I mean, it's totally unexcusable. And we, school districts have been screaming about this since 2014, 15, and hasn't gotten any better. That doesn't excuse it. It's, in fact, it should have been fixed long ago, but uh, it's not. Exactly. Yeah. No. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> I, you know. Anyway. All right. Any last questions? Um, all right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so uh, now we're going to talk about a draft of the 2020-21 Board of Education meeting schedule. Yeah. So if, uh, if I can address that, um, the schedule is in your board packet. Um, really the only potential issue, and the board can decide how they want to play this out, uh, but I think the only possible date during the summer that posed a potential problem for one of your colleagues was the August 11th uh, date. Um, and that, that itself is riddled with question marks because if we're still doing Zoom meetings by then, then there's no issue. Uh, if we're back to doing live face-to-face -face meetings and who knows, then that would be a meeting where possibly one of your colleagues would not be able to be in attendance. And those of you who've been on the board long enough know that I've always tried to work out the meeting schedule so that 
everybody who wants to be there can be there. But the reality is also that, especially during the summer, in most normal years when people have commitments to summer vacations, it doesn't always happen. Uh, obviously, we st would still need a quorum of at least four board members. And that meeting on the 11th, depending on the, the format of the meeting, could result in six out of seven board members being, um, being available. Uh, so the only, if that's not acceptable to the board, then we'd have to start fishing around for a, a different date in, uh, in early to mid-August. But uh, I, would, I would suggest that given, uh, given what I've just said and given the uncertainty as to what format would even be used at that time, that, uh, you know, it's probably a pretty good board meeting during the summer when everybody is there and it's not unusual for one or two people to not be there. So I, I'd recommend going with the schedule, but if you'd rather work around that, uh, that's up to you and we'll look for another date. Otherwise, I think you're good to go. Uh, I agree with you, Joe, unless, you know, anyone else feels differently, I think. That makes sense. Any everybody good with that? Uh, all right. Um, if I want to take just a couple of minutes to do our other two dates we need. We've been working through email, but uh, we need to pin it down in person, I think. Um, so the other date we need to come up with is the date for our goals workshop uh, and talking about our committee structures. We were kind of settled on July 14th, and then I found out that Mark can't be here that week. So. I'm going to suggest the week of July 20th, which is a board meeting week, but we're out of weeks where there's not a board meeting. So um, besides Tuesday, the 21st, how, how does that week look um, for everybody? Are you open? I'm open. I could do any, any day. Is there any, any days that people cannot do the week of July 20th? Diane, would that be an evening meeting or a day meeting? It would, because people are still working. So it would be an evening meeting. I think starting at five is the earliest we can start. Assuming we're in person, let's just assume that. Five o'clock would be the earliest. Okay, so five o'clock meeting the week of July 20th. Works for me. I'm, I'm looking, I'm not, no one's saying anything, so I'm going to say. Is yeah. Albert going to this too? Yeah, yes, yes, but I, okay, I already spoke with him, so unless he. Okay, that's what I would say, <laughs> you might want to, okay. Yeah, so how about, since we have the meeting on the 21st, how about uh, Thursday the 23rd at 5 o'clock? July 23rd? Matt? Okay, uh, Mark? Everybody's good? Okay, so we're going to pencil that one in for July 23rd um, at 5 o'clock. And then the second would be our retreat where we're going to get uh, somebody from NISBA to come. Um, so look, looking at the week of August 3rd for that, um, what I think we should just get give me two dates on that because I'm not sure the NISBA people, you know, what they can do for sure. I'm sure they'll work with us, but are there any dates that week? We do not have a board meeting that week. Are there any dates that do not work for anyone or work better? This is going to be a four hour block of time. Again, I think we can't start till five, but how, do, how does that week look for which, sorry, which week for that? Week of August 3rd. Okay. Any day that week is good for people, or we can eliminate some if some dates don't. Some days don't work. Um, the, the first couple Monday and Tuesday are not good. Okay. So are we good if I work with the the Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? Any of those three dates, and if I can lock down one of those three dates, is that all three of those days work? Yes, Steve. Yes. yes. Jacqueline said a yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm putting those down. <laughs> so that's instead of July 27th. Right? No, no, no. That's that we have her having both dates. They're two different reasons. Okay. The first one is the go the goals workshop, and the second one will be with the trainer from. No, I'm sorry. 
July 27th, though, had also been floated out as a retreat with the trainer. Oh, I, yeah, but now that we had to move the work, I was just looking at those two weeks as being three weeks. Okay. No, just go with that week unless I hear different from our newest board member when we get one or from um, the trainers at NISBA, then we'll all, it'll be one of these three dates in August. Okay. Is that good? Albert, that's good with you? Those were dates were good? Okay. Okay. Thank you. That was relatively painless. Uh, let's see. Moving on to uh, board committee reports, facilities. Oh, sorry. Um, just find my notes here. So we met on um, May 28th. Uh, the meeting discussed, uh, we, re we reviewed ongoing and upcoming summer work. Um, so at uh, middle school and high school, um, Sheldon and his crew have been working in the building to do needed cleanup prior to the asbestos abatement and flooring replacements that are scheduled for the summer. Um, this appropriate social distancing is being practices, uh, practiced and uh, PPE is being worn. Um, generator work is underway, um, but is um, waiting until school officially ends because the power needs to be shut off in the building um, to finish the connection of the generator. Uh, site work is ongoing right now. Uh, Topsoil is being installed at CLS. Um, work inside the track at the high school and drainage basins being placed in the parking lots. Um, we have a lot of summer work scheduled, uh, including irrigation of the fields at the high school, uh, paving, sidewalks, uh, new handicap ramp, recoding of the track, shingle roofing, and renovations to the kitchen. Um, a tree is going to be removed near the high school entrance uh, because of damage due to uh, drainage work that was done there and a new tree is going to be planted in its place. Um, as you know, we've had a ongoing odor issue in the guidance department. Uh, the source of the odor could not be determined, so the carpeting will be removed and a tile floor installed. Um, the responsibility for the odor has not been determined. Um, so the work will be paid for out of construction funds. Um, there is going to be some asbestos abatement near Sheldon's office and in the server closet near the entrance. And the high school office will receive new carpeting. Um, occupancy sensors for lighting will be installed in all the rooms and those are required by energy code. Um, they ensure that the lighting is turned off when no one is in the room. Uh, Chancellor, um, Kitchen operations are going to be moved to Chancellor for the summer because the kitchens at the other building will be under construction. Um, COVID-19 related meals will still need to be provided for the summer. Um, locker renovations will begin on June 12th and take place through the weekend into the 15th. Um, corridor ceilings and lightings will be replaced and anticipated that corridors will be painted. Uh, the window walls will be replaced, which is basically all the windows in the entire building at Chancellor. Um, those are expected to be delivered around the end of June. And uh, it was uh, specified that no windows will be removed from the building until the replacement windows are um, delivered. And the back parking lot will be repaved. Um, all the work is expected to be done by the end of December. Um, we will finance the project with a bond anticipation note and the district's portion of the BOCES project funding will also be combined in that note. Um, we're waiting from, for guidance from SED and governmental authorities for reopening of schools. Uh, hopefully we'll have that information by the end of June. Um, the district has to prepare a reopening plan and submit it to the state in July. Uh, we're hoping that we get the uh, guidance sooner than later, but um, enough about that. Um, Sheldon indicated we have enough cleaning and PPE supplies on hand for workers, but not enough to supply students and staff during school. Um, the question was raised if we should start stockpiling the supplies. 
and Sheldon says he intends to start stocking up on that, those supplies. Um, again, we're waiting for guidance from the state about what we're required to supply. Um, Joe has been attending many webinars and as time permits that deal with reopening and um, many of the presentations indicate that a deep cleaning is not recommended on a regular basis it is generally recommended that frequently touched surfaces such as door handles and handrails be cleaned twice daily. Our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, June 18th. Questions for facilities? All right, I have a couple, Mark. Um, the guidance office, the ongoing saga of the guidance office. So first question, they haven't been able to determine who is responsible for the odor. Does that mean like we're never going to know who's responsible and we're just moving forward and paying for it or we're still trying to figure out who's responsible? Yeah, so they, um, they, they've not been able to determine uh, what is causing the, I guess, what is causing the odor for the most part. Uh, they've run several tests and uh, they've been inconclusive. Um, so in order to see that the um, office is back in operation by uh, hopefully by sometime in July, um, we need to get the project done and uh, it's gonna have to be paid for out of construction funds. Right, but does that does that mean like that's the end of it? We're just paying for it, and that's correct. Um, all right, hold on. Who my other questions? Um, oh, the tree. Which tree are we talking about? And it's the one we that the board normally sits under during the commencement. Everyone loves that tree. <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> Hi, Sheldon, and <laughs> have to take care of it. Oh, there's no saving it. No, apparently not. Um, what else? Um, I thought there was another question. Um, are you playing Bender? Nope, I guess that's it. All right. Anybody else have any questions for facilities? All right. Um, we'll move on to uh, finance. So we met on June 4th. We discussed uh, what a contingency, contingency budget might look like for the school if the budget vote goes down. Uh, today we found out that there will be um, a second vote if the vote goes down uh, sometime after July 9th. Uh, discussed ongoing negotiations with our transportation contracts. We also discussed various reserve funds and how the district might schedule and possibly fund each of these reserves, but we noted that we needed to wait till the results of the budget vote were known uh, to determine how best to proceed. Uh, this was our last scheduled meeting for the Finance Committee. Uh, we will hold more meetings should the budget uh, get defeated. Questions for finance? Okay. Um, move on to personnel. Those are mine. Uh, there were several contracts that need discussion in executive session. And then we talked about um, the cafeteria program. And I just wanted to note, um, when we started in March, uh, 45 meals a week is what we were serving. And now we're up to 900 meals a week. So I just wanted to make note of that. Uh, it was a tremendous increase and it's a lot of meals that we're providing. Um, we talked about this over the summer, if we were gonna continue the program, we only have to continue the program through June 30th. But certainly our local food pantries have reached out to Joe and are concerned if we don't provide meals, if they would be able to pick up that. Um, so it's our hope that we could provide those meals, but there's a question about how that would work. Um, currently we're doing like a grab and, grow and go type program. If it was over the summer, it looks like kids would have to come in, which doesn't really make any sense. So we would, if we wanted to continue it, we'd like it to continue as a grab and go option. Um, it's not clear if the state would reimburse. Right now they reimburse for the cost of the meal and then the district pays the labor cost, but it's not clear if that would be reimbursed if it was not following guidelines. If it, if it was not reimbursed, it's uh, Larry estimated that the cost would be approximately $21,000 to cover the summer. Um, but there's you know, still a few things that have to happen um, with providing those meals. Joe. So I'll, I'll jump the gun on the good news. Uh, well, kind of a bad news, good news. Uh, Tom and, and Larry spent 
the better part of an entire afternoon on Thursday uh, trying to, I'll, I'll say this politely, uh, uh, trying to finesse uh, a grant proposal for the summer meal program to, to get around some of those issues that you alluded to. Uh, we think it's absolutely ludicrous that uh, we be required to provide meals throughout the summer, which the governor has said, but that we be required under different guidelines from the state education department to bring kids in to eat those meals in our cafeteria uh, with coronavirus and social distancing concerns and all the rest, to not be able to do it on a grab and go basis. So the two of them put together a grant proposal Thursday afternoon, sent it into SED. And on Friday, <laughs> this, is, this is life dealing with the state education department. Friday, uh, we received a new um, form for the summer meal program that addressed all those issues, that had check boxes for grab and go instead of on-site eating. Uh, so, uh, so we resubmitted the new form. Uh, we're waiting to hear back. We're hoping to hear back within the next week. But it seems like if the new form had all those exemptions on there as check boxes, that they would be permissible under these new emergency regulations. Uh, we're also hopeful that, again, because the governor's required it and because the, uh, the form now allows for pretty wide latitude to do it differently than in past summers, but the way schools have been doing it for the last three months, we're hopeful that there will be uh, financial support for that as well. But we hope to know in about a week, but we feel better about our chances today than we were last uh, end of last week. So that's good news. Thanks, that's a good update. I mean, thanks for submitting all that. I mean, I think it's an important service for Absolutely. our families and our community and hope that that can continue. Me too. Um, so the only thing uh, we also touched on the if the budget is defeated the any potential personnel cuts but you know Tom was working through some information there but it's kind of complicated on what you have to cut and what you can't cut and so we didn't we didn't get too much into that um, any other questions for personnel okay uh, that's all the committee reports um, we we'll move on to good news uh, we certainly heard a lot of good news from our principals, but does anybody have any good news? Joe? Other than what I already shared about the, uh, the summer food program. Uh, I have a, one bit of good news we haven't talked about. Um, our, uh, one of our high school students, Tommy Biker, is the valedictorian for the Career and Technical Institute, class of 2020. So it's the second year in a row that one of our students has gotten that. We're proud of him. Yeah, I'd, I'd also share, I'm not sure if it was mentioned earlier or not, um, might have been, but um, uh, our uh, area fire departments did a, did a drive-by uh, for all of our seniors, um, and uh, it was really pretty cool. Uh, I think Ed Davenport, I joined the, uh, Ed or Mark joined the, the Hillside Department, and the other joined, I think, Ryan Beck. Uh, I did the uh, ride along with the East Clinton Fire Department because that's the portion of the district where I live. Um, it, the, the greatest thing about it for me, not only honoring the seniors with that recognition, was the smiles on all the people's faces in the houses that we drove by. Whether they had seniors or they just came out of their houses because they heard all the sirens and to me, it was outstanding and exactly what we needed in, in with the way things are today was seeing people standing out there grinning from ear to ear. It was great. It was great. So uh, that's good news. And oh, Diane just wanted to add the uh, uh, Cynthia Bear and her husband were at Ryan, uh, Ryan Cliff. Uh, Mike Rocco was also at, at the Rhinebeck department. Kathy Giles tagged along at uh, West Clinton. So wanted to, to recognize them and second uh, uh, Joe's comments. It was uh, 
a, a great event organized by our uh, local fire departments, particularly Chief uh, Mark Long of, of Hillside. So thank you. Having a senior, it was fun. Uh, it maybe just shows how boring our life is, but we have three seniors on the road and we made a bit of a party of it. We had the free pizza that the Lions Club gave out and we had a table and we had, we, we just, we had a grand time. <laughs> and it, we had the special surprise of Joe driving down the road, which we didn't expect. So uh, I think all the seniors and the parents uh, appreciated it. So, and um, also the seniors today, I don't know if everybody got it, but the, the rounds are made. Seniors are getting uh, lawn signs that were dropped off by different members of the staff and a little gift basket of fun things, purple bandana, uh, decorated rock and free coffee and, you know, just uh, a lot of smiles going around from our seniors. So they felt, they felt the love today. Good, good. So. <laughs> All right, old business. Uh, I don't have any, Diane. Neither do I. Okay. Um, another opportunity for public comment. Would anyone like to make public comment? I don't see any. I don't know if that means there isn't any, but... Matt Grande. Okay. Matt? Hello. Hi, Matt. Hello. Hi. I just wanted to say just a couple of things really fast. Um, if you remember back in March, when we were talking about being closed and I asked everybody to go easy on those of us that have small children. Thank you for that. Thanks for, uh, you know, being flexible with us um, and continue to be flexible if we are closed in September. Uh, uh, also, thanks to Mr. Phelan who hired me about 20 years ago. So congratulations. <laughs> and, uh, Best decision you ever made. I'm sure you have that one written down somewhere. Not you're absolutely me. right, Matt. Hiring me, not the retirement, hiring me, I'm sure. Uh, well, I think you your wife much. was the best decision I ever made, but uh, you, you're a <laughs> close decision I ever made, definitely. <laughs> um, but thank you very much and good luck and have a good sure. night. Everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Matt. I just, as your, as your pictures, your beautiful pictures are up on the screen. And I remember you saying that about going easy. And I just had this vision of behind the screen, like complete chaos at your house. I'm not sure. That <laughs> thing, <but laughs> oh yeah. You want to come by tomorrow at 5.45 AM? It starts and it ends around uh, now. So, no, I, I have a high school senior. No one gets up at that time in my house. No. <laughs> uh, any other public comment? Okay. I don't. I don't see any. All right. So uh, we'll move on to any other. Joe? No, I don't have any. Um, okay. Um, then we're going to move on to our action items. Diane? Yeah. Would you note the note under 7.1.3, please? Um, oh, okay. Um, we, we need we have, need we need to take seven point one point yeah. three off for a reason I'll explain a little later on in the meeting. So I need a motion to ta to table it first, right? Can I so can I have a motion to table seven point one point three? Or wait, I have to read it first. Sorry. It's a recommendation of the superintendent of schools to accept the results of the June 9th, two thousand twenty annual budget vote and board member election. Um, and then we need a motion to table. A motion to table, please. Whatever I'm supposed to do here. I'll Second. <laughs> Second. <laughs> you never know what we're doing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Am I supposed to move? Am I supposed to second? All, all those in favor of, oh, any comment first? I think, Joe, you want to comment why we're tabling? Yeah, well, obviously, we were supposed to accept the results of the vote tonight, but according to mm -hmm. our governor, we're not going to be accepting the, the results of the vote until uh, after the ballots are counted uh, next Tuesday. Um, so uh, we will probably have to establish uh, another, uh, at least a, a relatively brief special meeting for a week from tonight to accept the uh, results of the vote. We're supposed to do it within 24 hours of the vote um, and not knowing uh, how late Whitney's going to be up counting ballots uh, next Tuesday night. Uh, we shouldn't be planning on a vote at 7 p.m. and then hanging around for four hours. So, but we'll get to that uh, 
under item. That's on a same thing it's on the. Yeah, uh, under yeah. It's in the uh, consent agenda. Yep, that's that that'll get us there. So. Uh, and so just people know it'll be the same time next week on Wednesday that we'll be hopefully accepting our results then unless something yep. else really happens. Yep. Okay. Um, all those in favor of tabling item seven point one point three. Okay, that would be table. And then, uh, so can I have a motion upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve the following consent items? So moved. Second. All right, um, any discussion? Okay, uh, all those in favor? That motion passes. Um, can I have a motion upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve as a final reading and adoption of modifications to board policy 9410 instructional substitute compensation see attached. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Right, motion passes. Uh, motion upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve the following resolution be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby authorizes its president to sign an agreement with Defile Transportation Incorporated regarding contractual obligations for the period commencing on March 16th, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2020. A copy of said agreement as presented to the board at this meeting shall be incorporated by reference within the minutes of this meeting. So moved. Second. Um, can I motion to table? So moved. Second. All those in favor of tabling? Okay, it's tabled. And then can I have a, a motion to move into executive session to discuss the contract? So moved. Second. All those in favor? That motion passes. All right, okay. thanks everybody for joining us. Good night, Nancy. Good night, Albert. Good night. Good night. <laughs>